Good morning. My name is Lata Poonamali, and it's my privilege to invite you to the next event of the Management and Social Justice Conversation Series, hosted by the New School Public Engagement, uh, Moana School of Policy Management Environment. And the New School Management, as uh, you, some of you might know, has a very distinctive flavor because we are grounded in the New School values of social justice, uh, equality, and creativity. And so I'm delighted to, uh, you know, bring this panel to you uh, because we are all struggling with the Black Lives Movement, either struggling uh, with it on the front lines or struggling about how do we integrate those and honor that movement in our organizational lives. And so here uh, is one opportunity to learn how some of these organizations uh, integrate this in their own practice and uplifting uh, the uprising for black lives and building in uh, equity and inclusion in this space. And so this panel is going to be moderated by the extremely dynamic Meghna. And uh, Meghna is an engineer by training and an activist by heart. And so she's been in the tech inclusion and equity space, uh, especially in the entrepreneurial space in the Bay Area, Silicon Valley space. And uh, so I'm excited to hear what the panelists have to say, and I'm sure so are you. So without much ado, thank you, Meghna, and over to you. Thank you so much, Lata, for the kind introduction. Um, hey, everyone, how's it going? Good morning. It's very early for us over here on the West Coast. I have my morning cup of coffee. Um, I'm sure a lot of y'all are also on the East Coast, maybe enjoying your lunch. Um, but whatever the time zone is, we are all in a time where time is warped um, with the pandemic and the revolution. Um, I actually want to give a huge shout out to Lotha. We um, originally planned this conversation as a conversation about the future of creatives in tech um, and what that future can look like. And as it became closer and closer to the panel, there's no way that we can talk about the future of work or the future of anything without really centering on the Black Lives Matter movement. And so while this is still in many ways focused around the tech industry, the creative industry. Um, this is really also about this movement. Um, and I'm just so excited to talk to y'all further about this. Um, and so just some more housekeeping in that same way. Um, we would love for this to be as much of a conversation as it can be in a Zoom format. Um, I know that we're all getting kind of used to these online events, um, but please drop your name in the chat, drop your city, um, what you're having for breakfast, um, lunch or dinner. <laughs> and um, get comfortable. We'd love to see some conversations happening. This is largely about uncomfortable and hard conversations. Um, at the same time, I also want to remind everyone that this is a really safe space. Um, we want to make sure that we're treating our panelists with care and love and respect. Um, this is not really a conversation where we're going to be debating racism. Um, we're kind of moving more, this is more of a conversation about action. Um, so making sure that you're really centering the conversation around that. Um, there's a lot of different resources out there if you are interested in learning more about the racism in our society and in our world. Um, and we can kind of talk more about that in a separate situation. Um, and so, yes, in that mode, we're encouraging you getting in the chat. Yes, thank you. Shout out Josh. Shout out Brandon. I'm seeing all these great people out here. Thank you, Tim, Shino. Um, and then also, if you have any questions, we ask you to respectfully ask them in the Q&A and we'll be kind of monitoring that throughout um, so that we can stay in touch and make sure that this is as active as can be. Um, finally, I want to also acknowledge that this is going to be recorded. Um, so everyone can view it later because it's sure to be a great conversation. And so with that, I want to introduce our amazing panelists. So um, as Lata mentioned, my name is Meghna Mahadevan. I'm an engineer, um, moved to the West Coast, super excited to work in tech. And then little did I know that I kind of hated it. I hated how indulgent all the environments were. I hated shuttling to Silicon Valley and moved to the K-Port Center where I worked um, in the past two years, uh, building out an accelerator for founders of color called I Love Oakland. 
And with that accelerator, I met these three amazing leaders who I want to um, really take a moment to say, like, I've met so many different people. And I think that's part of kind of moving through careers and meeting a lot of really inspiring people. Um, but you really start to notice people who stand out to you. And so I'm just so excited and honored to be on a panel with three of these amazing founders um, who are really leading the charge and leading the way in so many different ways. And I think that there's a lot to learn from the way that they operate. And with that, I would like to introduce um, our first panelist, Evangeline Elder. Evangeline, if you want to give a little wave. Hello. <laughs> Hello. As an editor, artist, manager, and music lover, Evangeline Elder, also known as Vang, has taken on both sides of the music industry over the past four years. After graduating from UC Riverside in 2013, Evangeline moved back to her hometown of Oakland, California, and reconnected with her love for music throughout the local scene and surfing the web. As a founder of Rehab Online Magazine, a small indie multi multidisciplinary music agency, partnerships with a record label, Empire, um, Evangeline has decided to take on a grassroots approach to her career and passions in the music industry early on. She's focused on startup momentum and breaking barriers for unsigned artists and been able to strategize and help new, develop new artists on a national scale. When it comes to her work ethic and business style, Evangeline believes in undeniable hard work, transparency at all times and intuition. And this is really shown through her work and co-founding the organization Women Sound Off. And then we have over here, um, Olivia Cueva. Olivia Cueva is a technologist, storyteller, and all around bad gal creative. She directs at the David E. Glover Emerging Technology Center in Oakland, California, where she provides free creative technology programming to over 400 youth, adults, and seniors each year. She founded a creative studio at the center, which trains youth in providing tech and design services to local organizations and corporations in the Bay Area. Originally from Berkeley, California, she received her master's from the Interactive Telecommunications Program at NYU Tisch, where she created projects ranging from wearable technology, augmented reality apps, video games, and interactive installations. She has over 10 years of experience working in nonprofit community organizations that focus on youth empowerment. Thank you so much for joining us, Olivia. Thank and you, Olivia. <laughs> And last but definitely not least is Kai Frazier. Kai Frazier is an educator turned ed tech entrepreneur passionate about using tech to provide inclusive and accessible opportunities for underestimated communities. She's a founder and CEO of Kai XR, the most inclusive and accessible educational VR platform where kids can explore, dream, and create. Before creating KaiXR, she worked with several museums, such as the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, as well as the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. Specializing in digital strategy and content creation, her work has been featured in Forbes, NBC, The Steve Harvey Show, and more. Kai's life story is one of grit and determination. It's so clear that nothing can stand in her way. Um, so I'm so excited to introduce all of these three panelists and um, just to give you all the run on the show. So first, Kai's going to kind of kick us off with a presentation about Kai XR storytelling. Um, and then Olivia will take the lead on um, a lot of her different creative endeavors and her approach with David E. Glover. And then I'll tee up our panel with a really short presentation uh, to talk a little bit about um, some context setting of how we can start approaching racism within our organizations. And then we'll have an amazing panel. We'll be opening up the last about 20 to 25 minutes of the panel for audience Q&A. So please stay in the chat, please stay in the Q&A. Let's have some really important conversations. Um, and Kai, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it off to you. I think you're muted, Kai, also. There you go. Good morning. Can you guys hear me okay? And I'm hoping my screen is up there. Um, I'm going to go ahead and kick us off. So thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Kai Frazier. I'm the founder and CEO of Kai XR. It's a VR platform where kids can explore VR field trips and then they can improve their tech skills by creating their very own VR adventures. Um, to have someone that looks like me creating a VR company is rare, uh, but I had a few touch points to VR. Uh, but most of the VR that I saw was used to create games or really gimmicky experiences. When I looked at VR, I saw it as a way to open doors for kids. Um, and then I could actually build a company that could spark a much needed uprising in education. 
When I ask an adult how did they first know what they wanted to be when they grew up, most start off by telling me they took that one field trip where they saw a research lab or a museum or a tech company. Uh, and those field trip experiences dramatically change their life trajectory. Um, I always get a bit jealous when I hear those stories because that was never the case for me. Uh, my sister and I grew up in a really tumultuous household where I had to hustle daily just to find us each 40 cents to afford our school's reduced lunch. That means we had no money to travel. In fact, we hardly left our neighborhoods. We depended on our school's field trips to give us access to a world beyond our circumstances. However, our school, along with half the schools in the country, have lost funding for these opportunities. A good portion of schools that have lost these field trip budgets are predominantly black and brown students. That means kids like my sister and I didn't get the head start that field trips bring. And that's unfortunate because when kids go on field trips, they're actually 95% more likely to graduate from high school. Uh, they're 63% more likely to go to college and they earn 12% more than their peers. So wouldn't that be amazing for economic mobility if black kids receive a 12% pay increase when they became adults just from going on field trips? I would eventually go on to become a teacher of majority black and brown kids and why teaching I was often frustrated because we didn't have a budget for field trips and then gaining access to tech was an everyday struggle. In my classroom, I had my dreamers, my kids that spoke no English, my kids that were homeless, my kids with incarcerated parents, and their families couldn't afford fancy new ed tech products. Um, where most schools will give each kid a laptop, we had a laptop cart that had dead computers and missing keys, and maybe we would get that once a month. So as much as I searched for accessible classroom solutions, I couldn't find any ed tech products that addressed the issues that I saw in my classroom. So I took all those experiences of being a black student, a black teacher, and then caring for the well-being of my many students. And that's what led me to create a VR platform for kids so they could explore the world beyond their circumstances. By using VR, um, kids get uh, exposure to new locations which they may not ever have the chance to visit. The field trips we provide for kids range from the Obama portraits to astronaut training. And then by using VR, they're improving their tech skills. So when creating a company, representation matters. I was extremely intentional about the content that I offer on my platform. If I was gonna search right now for VR content featuring black people, I would usually see titles about refugee camps or experiencing homelessness or even life in prison. Uh, but where's the content that inspires black kids? That's almost non-existent in the VR space. And I always think what content that my 10 year old self needs to see. Um, so I create a company that combats the lack of positive representation for black kids. One of the earliest VR filmings we did was of the Obama portraits so kids could be surrounded by black excellence. Uh, by using VR, kids get to learn about the portraits, um, the people who actually painted the Obama portraits. They get to experience the unique works of art, and then they get to see uh, the first black president and the first lady up close and personal. Um, I don't know of any other VR company where I can send someone to experience a rich variety of blackness. These are just a few of the examples that we have on our, our uh, a few of the VR titles that we have on our site. Um, so you can start from the Obama portraits, go to an Astro World concert, go to a pilgrimage in Mecca. Uh, we have a South Sudan spotlight on um, the civil wars and life after that. You can see the opening of uh, the Lion King on Broadway, and you can even meet a black aerospace engineer, who talked about her career or her journey to become an aerospace engineer. And we have so much more beyond these six titles. I also intentionally built my company around accessibility. Did you know that one out of three black teens lack computers at home and struggle to do their homework and they have to use their smartphones? One of four black kids don't even have Wi-Fi at home. Uh, if we have statistics on the digital divide and the homework gap, why aren't people making educational business models that take this into account? Now, if you think about COVID-19 closures and kids going from home, that means one out of three kids, three, one out of three black kids can't show up to class because they don't have the tools to. I'm a firm believer when you know better, you do better. Uh, so I made sure that I built my company around accessibility. And for those who build ed tech companies that don't take this into account is racist. Uh, so my company made this really challenging decision to make sure that all devices work in our platform. And if you couldn't afford a VR headset, no problem. You could use your cell phone and your cell phone signal, no Wi-Fi needed. Um, this was an intentional business decision to take into account the millions of black kids in the digital divide. 
And then I'd like to just end with like, who's behind the scenes? Um, when you put the most vulnerable people in charge, everybody wins. And I intentionally have a team of black educators in, in C-suite positions. This ensures that we're empowering black students and we're also empathetic to all students. Um, having a black team is rare and it's also revolutionary. Um, having black teachers dramatically changes the academic outcome for students. So I like to ask people like, take a moment to think about what grade were you when you had your first black teacher? And then how many black teachers did you have? I know for me, I got my first black teacher in sixth grade and maybe I had three um, my whole academic career. But when I talk to other people, that's a lot. Uh, so, I, so I understand how difficult that be, uh, that how difficult that is. So having a black teacher, like I said, it changes a student's lives. But for a black student, the effects of having a black teacher are jaw dropping. Um, if you're a black boy and have at least one black teacher between the age of, uh, between the grades of third through fifth grade, you're 40% less likely to drop out of school. Um, if you have that one black teacher, you have a 30% uh, increase uh, in, in an interest in going to college. Uh, so my team and I were teaching for black lives. We go above and beyond to ensure we're providing that lack of support that black students need and rarely get. So we're in a very pivotal point in education right now. We didn't need COVID-19 to tell us that we have a digital divide and that there are black kids being left behind technically and academically simply because we're not making these business models for their needs. So for the first time in my 15 years working in education, it feels like we now have an opportunity to make changes to our educational system to ensure all students have a fair chance at receiving a quality education regardless of their circumstances. Um, so I just have a slide with my information if you want to screenshot and get in touch with me, um, but I'm going to close off my presentation and hand it back to Megna. Thank you so much, Kai. Um, I want to invite anyone in the audience to ask me questions of Kai. I see some really great opportunities to potentially work together and partner in the chat, which is amazing. Um, hopefully we can follow up with you later. I think um, just to kick off an audience question um, and see if anyone else wants to um, ask anything. I would love to ask you, Kai, I know that when we were working together in the incubator, one interesting thing that was pretty enlightening to me was, and you kind of alluded to it um, during in your presentation, but how much people push you to kind of create your services for um, incarcerated folks or people within the prison system um, and the way that money plays into the lack of funding for education startups. Yeah, it's it's been extremely challenging to get funding. The the stat, the venture capital stat is only 0.2% of black women ever receive venture funding. Um, to start my company, knowing that I actually sold my house, my car and everything I own just to make the money to start a company because I knew what I was up against. Um, when it came down to when it came down to seeking funding, um, not all money is good money and most money usually isn't good money. Uh, so we've had a lot of opportunities where people have encouraged me to even change my business model in a way that will depend on the privatization of prisons to get money. Uh, for example, I, I want to go to juvenile detention centers, I go to schools, and I also want to go to prisons. I had a particular VC that told me if I just banked, if I just put my bet on prisons and more bodies coming to prisons, then he would consider funding me. And I'd never made my company to uh, be a part of that issue. I made my company to make sure we can empower people if they are in prison, not build a whole business model around we need more bodies in prison. Um, so we walked away from that. Needed. Yeah, thank you so much, Kai, for sharing that. I just think that the way that you have stayed so true to your mission throughout everything you're building is really inspiring. Uh, thanks for sharing. We'll kind of come back to you with um, more questions with the panel. Um, and I see some questions coming in. I guess one question here is, how do you bring a trauma-informed lens into the work that you do, both for your team and the product itself? Sure. So um, you mentioned a little bit before I did this, I worked at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and I worked with um, peoples of all, all any contemporary genocide or mass atrocity you can think about. Uh, and I, I gained a lot of perspective on trauma um, and how to tell stories of that trauma as well, both for the person who's telling the story and the person who is listening to the story. And that's something I see majorly lacking a lot of VR companies. Uh, if it bleeds, it uh, leads. So a lot of people like love those really, you know, gory, like 
trauma, trauma, traumatic uh, experiences. And, and we're not putting parameters around people to process that. So for a lot of our VR experiences, if we are talking about more traumatic um, material, we make sure we have critical thinking questions, teacher prompts, things like that, so people can unpack and then just have the space to process those challenging experiences. Sorry, I keep talking for me on. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kai. Um, I actually see a really good question in here, but I'm going to circle back to it in our panel because I want to ask everyone this question. Thank you, Sergio, for asking this. Um, with that, Kai, we're going to come back to you with the panel and I'm going to um, open it up to Olivia um, for your presentation. Thank you, Magna. Thank you, Kai. Thank you for that great presentation. That was awesome. Okay, so let me share my screen. Bear with me for a second. All right, present. All right, can everybody share, see my screen? Okay, great. Um, so hello everyone, my name is Olivia Cueva. I am the director of the David E. Glover Emerging Technology Center, which I'm really excited to share with you about today. Um, but I'm also an inventor, a technologist, and I'm also a storyteller. And so I'm gonna be talking to you today a little bit about my work and what has led me to um, my work at the David E. Glover Center um, and also about storytelling because a lot of my work, all of my work is really informed by and powered by the stories of the communities and the people that I work with. So I wanted to start off by just posing this question. Um, what are the stories that have shaped you? So what are the stories that you've grown up with that have um, shaped you and sort of um, shaped your experiences um, from your elders, from your parents. Um, for me, um, it started with the stories from my parents. So um, this is my dad. Um, my dad, um, I grew up hearing stories about my dad growing up in the Andes in Peru, um, waking up really, really early in the mountains in the fog, barefoot, um, walking miles and miles barefoot. My dad didn't have shoes until he was seven years old. Um, so those are some of the stories that I grew up with. Um, I also grew up um, hearing stories from my mom. Um, this is my mom. Um, my mom grew up um, actually around a lot of um, the black radical political organizing that was going on in the 1960s in Chicago. Um, her father, my grandfather, was a civil rights doctor um, in Chicago at the time. Um, you guys can see my mouse. So this is him right here at this march um, in Chicago in 1965. Um, and right over here is Martin Luther King. Um, um, he, my grandfather was Martin Luther King's doctor. He was also a good friend and doctor of Reverend Jesse Jackson. I grew up hearing stories, um, personal stories from my mom about uh, the chairman of the Black Panther Party, Fred Hampton, Stokely Carmichael, um, you know, asking her what books she would read. Um, so those are some of the stories that I grew up hearing um, as, a, as a young person um, in my household. And so I was always fascinated with stories um, and believed that, you know, everyone had a story to tell. And I was and I'm so curious about people and through their upbringing and through these stories. And so I became a radio journalist <laughs> um, at the age of 14. So um, this is me in uh, 2003, I was about 14 years old and um, I started my career in radio uh, journalism at an organization called Youth Radio um, in Oakland, California. Um, and um, what Youth Radio was really amazing for was that it, it taught me and it showed me that I had a voice and I had a story to tell. Um, and, you know, I continued down that path all through high school doing radio journalism um, and went to move to Brooklyn, went to Brooklyn College, studied broadcast journalism. And my first job out of college was at StoryCorps, which is a national oral history project. Um, and I traveled the country for a year recording hundreds of stories of people from all walks of life. So this is me 10 years later in the StoryCorps booth recording stories. And that was it, that was set. I was like, I am gonna be a radio journalist. This is what I do. Um, well, when I moved back to the Bay Area in 2013, um, I was, came back to, a, to my home that was in extreme crisis. Um, so we were seeing like the new 
wave of the tech boom since the dot-com era. Um, and we were also thus seeing super huge rises in housing prices, um, exponential rise. Um, and so working in journalism at the time, it was like every story that was coming across the feed was either um, you know, some really, really stupid tech gadget, like this drone, like that comes out of your watch. And I just was like, why do we have that? Um, or the fact that like no one I knew who I grew up with could afford to live here anymore. And so I was um, faced with sort of this um, kind of turning point um, where I was really not sure that my work in public radio was really having an impact on the communities that I cared about. Um, and um, I knew that I wanted to sort of make a pivot. Um, and I think I also wanted to have some kind of impact where in tech, where I could actually start making things that were useful and were empowering to people. And so I made a move into technology through a program called ITP at NYU Tisch. Um, it's a two-year graduate program, um, and it really is this sort of um, mad scientist school. That's kind of the best way that I can describe it, um, where I was able to dream up whatever I wanted and learn the tools to make it happen. So I'm going to talk to you about three projects that I made um, through this process. Um, and also how like my personal experiences and, and the stories of my community helped shape that work. So the first project that I made was designed for my 92 year old grandfather. Um, he was living in Chicago at the time, um, really completely independent his whole life and was just starting to show signs of like needing some more um, care. And so we moved him to the Bay Area to live with my family. And he was mostly fine, right? He liked to just chill, sit on the couch, drink his coffee, read his paper, no one bother him. Um, but um, when he would get up to make food or use the restroom, he would get faint. And um, that was really scary. Um, sometimes he wouldn't come to, we'd have to call the hospital. And so to counteract that, my family would, you know, really hover around, um, start asking, you know, hey, dad, do you need to get up like every 20 minutes? And so, of course, he hated being treated like a three year old. So this was the problem that I that I wanted to solve for. So what I created um, was a floor mat that I embedded with uh, conductive fabric and pressure sensors that could be placed at his feet. It was connected to um, GSM text messaging and a, and a microcontroller called an Arduino. These were all things I learned in grad school how to program. Um, and so when he stepped on it with enough pressure, it would send a text message to somebody in the house who was nearby, letting them know that he was up and they could come to his, um, to his aid without having to hover. And so this is a prototype of my grandpa using it, showing that um, the text messages are coming through and the message said grandpa's on the move and this was the, the product that I made. So it was called the assistive mat um, and yeah and that was the very first project that I made um, kind of using that experience and that problem solving that, that was very personal to me to create it. Um, the second project that I'm going to talk about, um, I was the subject so um, I was experiencing um, really, really uh, horrible, horrible pain from um, menstrual cramps at the time, what I would later find out to be endometriosis. If you guys don't know about that, look that up. Um, but anyway, um, it was, um, I was having all of this pain and so much so that like it was hard for me to like go to class on these days. Um, and I knew that heat is really good to like, for, to relax muscle pain. Um, and so what I designed was um, a high-waisted, like, sleek undergarment that had a very thin cloth heating fabric placed in the front and the back, so like in my lower abdomen and my lower back, um, where I could actually um, wear these panties that would, like, soothe menstrual cramps on the go. So they came with like I, I designed like a little battery pack that could actually be plugged into your computer so you could like charge it on the go. So these were the prototype hot pants, I called them, and, um, and they worked and they were like washable and everything. 
So, um, so that was another, that was another project that I made around this. Um, and then the third project that I want to talk to you um, focuses on a friend of mine, um, Gary. Um, Gary and I were friends in high school and not gonna lie, like had a super huge crush on him. Um, and um, I found out that Gary would paint houses on the weekend with his uncle. And so I somehow convinced my parents that I, we should hire Gary to paint my room because all of a sudden my room needed to be painted. So this is Gary painting my room in 2005. Um, and yeah, I was like super excited and that was great. And we paid Gary and he was great, super professional, all of that. Um, but a couple years after this photograph was taken, Gary was shot and killed by an Oakland police officer. Um, we know the story, like confused as like, like um, mis ID'd as like a suspect um, uh, from an officer who had passed like, you know, um, aggression and like violent behavior towards people in the past. Um, I marched with Gary and his friends and family in front of Oakland City Hall. And, um, you know, we know, we know how that goes. Um, but anyway, a beautiful, a beautiful mural was put up um, uh, near where Gary was killed under the BART, under the BART tracks in Oakland. Um, and it was just this like really beautiful memorial to him. I would drive by it um, all the time. It was, it was near my house and it was just like this beautiful way to remember him. But a couple years after that, BART, uh, which if you guys aren't familiar, BART is our, um, our subway system in the Bay Area, took it down, like buffed it. And I think it was kind of after the Oscar Grant um, riots were happening or something. I'm not sure the correlation, but they took it down. And so um, there was nothing there. Um, and so I always wanted to um, kind of figure out a way to put something back there. This is what um, the original mural looked like in 2007. And this is the same exact spot 10 years later in 2017. And as you can see, it's just like, there's nothing, it's ugly, it's whatever. So like I said, I always wanted to figure out a way to pay tribute to my friend. And now I knew all of these cool technology tools to try and figure that out. So um, in grad school, I had learned a software, a free software called Unity 3D. It's a gaming engine, um, really recognized by a lot of indie gamers um, to make video games. But I also worked on a project making augmented reality. Um, so I knew that there was potential with this. Um, and so I wanna share with you what I created. I uh, created an app that would put the mural back using your phone on that spot. So I'm just gonna go to a quick video really quick. So bear with me um, and show you this. just told to wrap up a little bit so I'm going to just kind of move to the next part kind of quickly um, but um, again this is the the outcome of the mural and, and the reason why I share these stories is because um, to me I just really realized that all of these technology tools are accessible to people they just and like easy to learn you just need to have access to the tools to be able to do that um, which leads me into my work 
as the director of the David E. Glover Emerging Technology Center. Um, we are a design um, technology and makerspace in the heart of East Oakland. Um, like Meghna says, we are the first and only um, uh, creative tech lab in this area. Um, and we do free programming um, for youth, adults, and seniors. Um, and we actually ha have been in the community for over 20 years. We're actually a part of an organization called OCUR, which has, has a 60 plus year legacy um, in Oakland doing capacity building work um, in the community for marginalized communities, um, a black led organization. David Glover pictured here on the right was the former executive director and he opened the center um, back in the 90s when he saw um, how um, people of color were going to be left behind in the new wave of tech economy jobs. Um, and so since that time, we have uh, created a creative tech educational program that includes video game design, virtual reality, AI, um, animation coding, um, and we continue to do basic digital literacy for seniors as well. Um, we also just launched a makerspace this fall, which I was really, really excited about. So we do 3D printing and laser cutting work as well. Um, I'm also really excited to share that we have a fee for service studio, which was a dream of mine to do where we do things like um, STEM education, professional development, immersive design experience, website development. This is my two live crew here of the first youth uh, that we were able to pay to offer these services. Uh, we launched a prototype of this in the fall um, where the Oakland athletic baseball team was our clients and we developed prototypes for them to design um, how, um, uh, how we can en enhance youth engagement at the Col Oakland Coliseum. So that was really, really exciting. Um, I can share more stories, but I'm just going to kind of go through this really quick. Um, this is just a really cute picture of, of a young, one of our young people teaching our um, elders how to use his ver VR Spider-Man game. Um, and like Kai showed you, it's all powered by your team. And this is my incredible, amazing team that we currently have at the Glover Center. And I just want to say that like, you know, for me, it's super important for the people that are teaching and leading this work to look like the students. Um, and this is what technology um, uh, folks should look like. These are what the tech, the leaders in technology should look like. So I'm modeling that here and shout out to my amazing team could not do any of this work without them. Um, just really quickly during the pandemic, we uh, designed and assembled a hundred protective face shields using our makerspace equipment. Uh, these are photos of um, a nurse at Kaiser and um, a frontline worker at um, a food pantry utilizing our face shields. Um, yeah, and you know, this is our makerspace of communal innovation and just kind of to bring it back, you know, we've really built out um, a way for people to use technology and design to tell their own stories and, um, and design tools as a form of resistance and to better serve their communities. So thank you very much. And you can follow us at the Glover Center and all this good stuff. Here's my information. Thank you for your time. Oh, let me stop. <laughs> Thank you so much, Olivia. I am always so inspired by the way that you really bring creativity into every aspect of your leadership in such an organized way that really empowers and brings to your point, like intergenerational people, um, intergenerational folks in Deep East Oakland. And for people who don't know, Deep East Oakland is very under-resourced in terms of the way that things develop in the Bay Area. Um, it's so important to go out into the community and to be where people are. Um, I think that I, in my work, and I'm actually going to go ahead. So I see a lot of different questions coming up, but um, just for the sake of time, I kind of want to move into the panel um, and we can ask those questions there, which I'm really excited about. Um, I'm going to just share my screen to set a little bit of context for the panel, but hopefully it won't, I'm not going to take up too much time with this. Um, but really what I want to talk about is we are here in this moment um, for this uprising for Black Lives. And can y'all see my screen? Yeah? Okay, cool. Um, 
And so first, I just want to take a second to acknowledge, um, although this is a virtual event, I'm currently residing on Ohlone land, occupied territory of the Huichin village. Um, this is me and my tech shuttle kind of <laughs> transporting in this way that I was never able to turn a blind eye to passing so many different homeless encampments. Um, as Olivia mentioned earlier, this is something that the Bay Area and increasingly the world likes to normalize as something common to view um, and it's not normal. And that's largely why we're here, um, which brought me to my beautiful journey of working with these folks um, with iLab Oakland, which, is our ex um, which was our accelerator with the Cape Forest Center um, and co-working space. Um, but really I want to talk about why, why we're here and even just thinking about this presentation, um, it was interesting to kind of try to frame something and um, I think someone said it in the chat, sorry I can't remember your name, but just the way that um, this storytelling starts, right? We are actually in a historical moment, but it's kind of funny that we always refer to history after it happened. But this is me kind of letting you know, like, <laughs> this is a moment, this is not just a moment in time, this is not just something that happened, but this is a shift happening, a shift in thinking and a shift in moving, in moving. and this is the new normal. Um, and you can really see this in the way that the youth are showing up. I know in Oakland, many of the protests are youth led by 18 year olds, 20 year olds, high school students um, leading the largest protests. 90% of Gen Z supports Black Lives Matter. And so if you're not with this movement, you will really get left behind very quickly. And I want to emphasize to every single person on this call that everyone has a place in the uprising. So every company, every organization is a social impact organization. It might be positive social impact, it might be negative social impact, but we all have impact in this world and we all hold power. And if we're not utilizing the power that we have, we are really being complicit in white supremacy. Um, I also want to make sure that whenever we're thinking about the Black Lives Matter movement, we must be very deeply intersectional. Um, we must think about all Black lives. Um, we must think through how we're um, yielding and making space for Black leaders, Black trans and cis women. Um, and so I kind of want to introduce some frameworks to begin really thinking about addressing the way that your institution upholds racism. What I'm seeing a lot of reactions from organizations are things like one time donations, um, social media graphics for branding, or a new DNI initiative, a new um, diversity and inclusion hire to try to diversify teams. But racism is such a large problem that if you try to think of what your solution is, it's really not ever going to get there. So some things I want to offer as food for thought are, how are you defunding racism? How are you assessing your organization's partners and suppliers? We all play a role in this pipeline to prison, pipeline to police. What's your role? And once you start to reckon with that and assessing your own place in the system, your own operating procedures, are you calling the cops? That's where we can really start to think about racism as a wider construct. Um, it's also important, I'm seeing a lot of people trying to start investing in Black employees, which is important, but we need to be investing more broadly in Black lives. Um, addressing industry-wide racism is really important. Um, for, we talked a lot about the tech industry, the music industry, the fashion industry. Um, we must invest in the Black communities that surround us, as well as paying reparations, which means not only donating one time, but donating consistently. And then finally, and very importantly, is accountability. We need more transparency with leadership. We need to create ways for different people in power to hold each other accountable. And taking a visible stance throughout all of this is really important. Um, what we see a lot of in reactions to what's happening is outsourcing solutions to racism. And the reason that we brought these three leaders here today is because they move with this in every way that they act. There's no solution that can be solved with um, a new nonprofit founded or a new investment fund. A lot of this work is internal. And what I want to see a lot more is less, um, it's a lot easier to fund solutions to racism than actually changing the structures within. So I would love to see more ideas out there involving how the privileged and powerful leaders can kind of start to acknowledge these structures and surrender some of their power and status. Um, this is really an interesting time and it requires a lot of introspection. I think COVID-19 and um, we saw a lot of what was happening um, within the world and ways that the world was really relying on frontline workers, which are mostly folks of color to make sacrifices for our well-being. And now we see this uprising and what that means is that a lot of responsibilities within a lot of people who are white collar or elite or in leadership need to similarly make sacrifices for the well-being of our communities. And so with that, I would love to open it up for this panel. 
Um, can y'all see all of us? Can I see what's going on in the chat? How's everyone doing? How's everyone's headspace? Can I just get some some love in the chat or comments in the chat? So you need a refill on coffee. What's up? A copy of your slides. Yes, I can definitely send that out. Yay. Yes, Olivia rocks. And yes, Olivia is training training an S-team. Okay, amazing. Yes, go native land. Cool. Thank you so much for all of these <laughs> great things happening. All right. Um, okay, everyone. So let's get to the business and hear the people that we want to talk, um, that we want to hear talk. Okay. Um, so let's kick this off. Kai, Olivia, Evangeline, thank you again and again and again for your thoughtful time, your leadership um, in this moment. We have been in a pandemic and a revolution and like, I don't even know what day it is or month it is anymore. Um, and we're kind of a month into this uprising. How are y'all feeling at this moment in time? Um, we can see. Hi, Hi everyone. Um, Evangeline here. I'm feeling good. You are on camera and gallery view on the panel. Oh, sorry, I was reading the chat. <laughs> I'm feeling good. Uh, right now I'm focused on balancing, I would say wellness and self-care with my endeavors, uh, which includes Women's Sound Off, which is an Oakland born and bred platform. Uh, I'm from East Oakland and Women's Sound Off uh, serves women by POC, women of color, non-binary individuals. Uh, our staples are content and events. We have a strong digital community and we have a strong um, in real life community and lately i've just been trying to balance the self-care thing as well as work you know as a black person uh, who's running different content and posting on social media it can be a little exhausting so for me i'm trying to just take time since i am someone with direct trauma experience you know um but besides that i've been feeling a little bit better these days and, and just trying to motivate more of our followers to mobilize and be active in the black lives matter movement and, and make that a true and organic lifestyle and actually spend time with people in the black community. Yeah. I'll say through everything, of course, it's been really weary. And then every time that I feel weary, I take um, hope working with kids uh, because I'm always inspired and I know uh, what's coming up behind us in uh, generation. So I'm really excited to see what they're going to do um, with, you know, this next movement and the choices they're making. So that's been inspiring through everything for me. Yeah, echoing what both um, Evangeline and Kai said, um, I think finding a lot of joy in the fact that I think what we provide for people is um, a, a space to feel inspired and have joy during this time. So, you know, we're running virtual summer camp for youth on Zoom, um, which has been great. Kai led our first virtual field trip last Friday, which was amazing. Um, and, you know, here, you know, just having and seeing their joy every day to like sign on and learn how to do all of these cool tools. Um, as well as the seniors, the seniors learning Zoom and, you know, getting on every day and they're like, we want class to be longer. And it's just like, I think what makes this time so challenging is that we're in a pandemic um, and we were supposed to like not be with each other or physically touch each other and, and be in community. And so much of our work was is evolved um, and, and result, re re revolves around the center. And so it's been really amazing and beautiful to see that our community continues um, even in this time virtually. So that's been how I'm coping. Wow, thanks y'all for sharing. And I think I, I really wanna elevate and also just like, again, thank you all so much for taking out the time. Cause I think in this moment, there's so many ways that people are suddenly realizing that we need to be looking to leaders of color, women of color, um, who are kind of, who've been doing these practices. And I'm so glad to hear, um, Evangeline, you're just uplifting self-care because that is so important to sustain this movement. Yeah. And also the way, Olivia, to your point of like finding inspiration. And I think that there's something, um, Kai, that you said earlier, I'm, I'm going to mess up the quote, but you said something along the lines of like, um, what bleeds leads. What was this? What was it again? The media rule is if it bleeds, it leads. And that's how we do stories. Yes, that's, <laughs> I hate that phrase, but that's also like, so like, just a very good representation of a lot of what we're seeing on social media. And it's so aggressive to like be revisiting so many different traumas, but I'm grateful to have y'all here in leadership. And like this next question I kind of want to move to y'all is like, 
each of your organizations works to uplift the black community in a lot of different ways, um, which you've all elevated. I think eventually if you could talk a little bit about Women's Sound Off, that'd be helpful for the audience. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about your own journey to finding your unique place in the movement for black lives? And again, kind of to what we said earlier, um, only share like what is feeling comfortable for you. Yeah, so my um, amazing co-founder, Carmine and I are both black women and she's from San Francisco, Hunters Bay Point. And when we set out to create Women's Sound Off, we wanted to create something that wasn't out there. We didn't feel like there was an intersectional platform from the top down. And for black people in general, it is very important to see an example of black leadership at an executive level. If you don't have that in your company, if, if you're not training also someone to get to that point and arrive at that point eventually in your company, you have a lack of representation, you have a lack of someone seeing a mirror of what they can potentially be. Um, and black people have, over historically have not had a lot of mirrors of what we can be. So that's why in, injecting that has been really important for us as a platform. Um, and it starts with leadership top down, like it has to be throughout every part of the org. Um, and we really believe in intentional diversity. So for us, um, our goal is still intersectional feminism and a whole new form of feminism that departs from a historically um, white feminist centered movement uh, we focused on really just uplifting women, women of color, and doing actual program work with Black women also. You know, not just a one-off event or a one-off program, but actually doing, or one-off program, but actually doing work that says, we're investing in you throughout the next few years. <laughs> we want to see you grow, transition careers, see you actualize your dreams. So for us, when, when a lot of the protests started happening, we were already kind of doing similar work, um, but we shifted gears and started doing more joint combination of COVID work and um, and racial justice work as well. And they both kind of honestly go together, especially with the East Bay in the Bay Area being like the highest with COVID rates. Um, but the transition was fairly easy, but for those who are just now transitioning and trying to bring their org into the movement, you really have to talk to your employees and, and really sit down and understand their concerns and really declare a safe space and research and talk to people who carry safe spaces to figure out how to create a safe space. A lot of people don't come forward when it comes to um, even talking about black issues at their job or their company because they don't feel comfortable and no one else talks about them. So to all of my people who are leaders on the, on the call and stuff, making sure that you create the space um, and you set the tone is really important. And I think with Women Sound Off, we've always worked hard to set the tone and be honest and real with that tone. That was a mouthful, but yes, that's my answer. <laughs> That's amazing. And I really quickly before you jump in, Olivia, I also want to emphasize one point that you made, Vange, of um, kind of like the leaders on the call. And I encourage everyone, I think this is a moment where everyone's kind of finding themselves in unique places of leadership. And even if you didn't consider yourself a leader, suddenly you have people looking to you. Um, so whether or not you step into that leadership role, you are still leading. And choosing not to lead, choosing not to act is also leadership. Um, and this is really kind of the way that we're expanding our definition of what it looks like to lead. Uh, go ahead, Olivia. I'm not sure if I was going to jump in next, but I'll go <laughs> and jump in. Um, so the quite wait. So Magda, the question is, can you repeat the question? Yes, Sorry. I would love to repeat the question for you. Thank you. Um, so how basically um, tell us about your journey to finding your unique place in this movement for black lives. Yeah, I mean, I think like all of the other panelists on this on this panel, uh, you know, all our work is grounded in that already, you know, and so it's not like we're stepping up into this because of what's going on right now in this like moment. Like this is what we're invested in and have been invested in throughout time. Um, I would say that you know, echo echoing what Evangeline just said, just around like you know really checking in with our community from day one, like right when we had to, you know, shut down, um, just really checking in with everyone and making sure that they have what they need and being able to help them get what they need. If they, you know, you know, kind of turning into almost like a social service, we are sort of like a social service organization. And so really being able to be like, do you need equipment? Do you need mental health services? Being able to relay that on to folks. Do you need food? Uh, we are, doing meal distribution out of the center two days a week, you know, and like really great gourmet food and meals. So I think that, you know, it's not like this is something we're stepping into now. Like this is just our work and this is what we're going to be committed to doing regardless of what's going on. 
I just want to add one thing. I know for myself, uh, my background is in history. Um, so there's a really fine line between news and history. So I always challenge people to think about how we document and tell the stories of this time right now. Um, whose perspectives are we telling and how do we prevent this from being literally his story, which is what history is. Um, so a lot of my work, um, even in museums, is going out and collecting artifacts, taking pictures, all these things. And when it comes to being 30, 40, 50 years from now, we always have this issue of where are the photos, where are the things, whose story, you know, and, and, and we're seeing that right now being in Oakland. One of the things that's really interesting to me is uh, support is building and, and uh, for uh, a Black Panther Museum. And it's a struggle to find the photos, the audio, all these things because we never thought that that was history and nobody's recording it. So I will encourage everybody about where your part is that we need everybody's perspective because there will come a time where we have to tell the story. And Kai, I think that's such a great point. And I want to kind of go into that a little bit more with this next question. Um, so Theodore Wilkins, thank you so much for asking this question, um, wants, wants to know a little bit if we can speak on the sustainability of this movement. And I would like to add to that um, just the question of like, how are you framing this moment in your own mind? Um, I think there is a part of trying to understand living history in the present, um, but also how are you framing this, move, this movement in your mind and can you speak to any of the sustainability of it? Uh, sorry, I was on mute. Um, I think there's two ways I would address this question. Um, one is the more kind of like basic form, which is you've got to sustain the movement with programs and long, long, long term programs. You do need like an acute, you need to have an acute response to acute events that happen, you know, but at the same time, while that's going, that can't be your only strategy. Like immediate aid is really important. An immediate aid should come up as crises keep happening. Uh, but on a long-term level, you have to implement programs that really center Black people and also center Black youth. You know, especially when in the Bay Area, it's really important, of, um, as of the, of those who are also in New York, like, it's really important to bring in kids early. And I think Kai can also speak to this too. Like, she works with a lot of, like, teens and stuff, and, and those are some of the people who are the subjects of her um, virtual reality programs. And, like, you have to create programs that bring Black people in at an early age, and you also have to create resource groups and create an environment that Black people can thrive in at your company or on your platform. Um, but you have to create long-term stuff. You can't sustain the movement if you do not create long-term curriculum and long-term programs and hire the right people to come in and implement those programs who do this kind of work. Don't try to do it yourself completely. Bring in the qualified people the, I know so many amazing Black women and Black men that, and uh, Black non-binary creatives that I'll drop in this chat who are doing this work, are hired by major companies, and they're going in and really shaking shit up. So I will put that in the box. Um, and these are people who are national also. Second thing, second thing is, you can also help sustain the movement by helping to sustain Black leaders. A lot of the issues of our old civil rights movement in the 60s and 70s is that Black leaders were not sustained. They were either killed at the height and the peak of their effectiveness, or their comrades were killed, or they fell to the drug boom for cut crack, it goes on and on. So in order to, for this movement to last, our leaders also have to be healthy and sustained. So if you are not able to necessarily get on the front lines, you can empower the people who are on the front lines. But you, what you can't do is be silent. It can't be neither, you know? It has to be one or the other. Empower the people who are already doing the work to help them sustain their leadership because it takes a very big toll on us as leaders to lead this movement, you know, and instruct people while we're also trying to deal with our mental health and our self-care. And that's how leaders can go downhill, especially Black leaders specifically who are working with Black trauma or work that centers Black trauma. It's very hard to do that. So like I said, um, programs are really good, curriculum, um, working with your local organizations. This, is, this battle is going to be fought locally, 100% locally and regionally. This battle is not going to be fought from a national level. Look, do your research also and invest in local platforms in addition to giving to like NAACP or so and so. But yeah, that's right. That's, that's how I feel. And I want to actually ask a follow up question, which can be directed to all the panelists. Um, but in that same vein, so this question is from Sandina Ahmed. Um, our organization shifts the weight of the work to BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, people of color, staff, or leaders? And how do we shift the balance to put more accountability on white leaders? 
And I think something really important that you just said, Evangeline, was um, really empower the people who are already doing the work to sustain leadership. But what does that look like to put accountability on the white leaders surrounding? Um, the white leaders have to get, have to, you have to start first. But number two, you really have to hire people to come in and help you. You know, like this is, this is not you fighting racism in the dark. Like you have to really understand the black community and understand the plight of the black community in order to really assist and help the black community. Um, and that does also really include spending time with black people in real life. I think a stat came out that 75 or 76, 76% 76 of white Americans don't have any black friends and don't hang out with any black people or really know too many black people. That's 75 to 76% of white Americans. That means that white people have to talk to white people. That's very important. But in order to do that, you also have to be kind of like armed with the right information. So spending time and talking, um, I recommend talking to my friend Akila, Dr. Akila Cadet. She's based in the Bay Area, but she works in Atlanta, New York. Um, she has been doing this for 10 years. She will come in and turn your stuff upside down and work with you and honestly have give you the hard truth and really move your organization or your platform along. So that's someone who can come in. But I, I do think that for white leaders, they have to start with having the conversations, giving back to the community, putting like your money where your mouth is. And I think number four is getting the correct training so you can also help sustain the movement um, and be aware of your own privilege. But it starts with those things to me all together. Yes, Josh, thank you for dropping this Akila Kade Forbes article in the chat. Um, Olivia and Kaiser, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I can just jump in on just some things that I'm looking forward to as far as sustainability. Um, I think I like cry each time I see a um, funding coming from the police department and going to education. And one of the biggest things I was really excited about is maybe like a week or two ago, um, Oakland just voted to take the police out of the schools. Uh, and when we're talking about sustainability, I can't tell you how many schools I'm in where we have police, but we don't have counselors and we don't have nurses. Um, and that's, that's, if you look at the statute, it, it will make your heart break. Um, so I'm really excited for all the moves that we're seeing because you have no idea what it does to kids to grow up in a way being police going through, you know, it, it's, and that's most of the schools I work at because I work with black and brown kids. So you're taught to fear the police at a very young age. Um, I think LAPD just put some money, took money out of LAPD and put it into uh, schools too. So I'm really hoping that that's a wave that keeps on going because we need so much funding in these schools to start to see some long-term sustainable options um, in education. Yeah, I think that the policy piece is so important to add. And yes, like o um, OPD leaving, um, Oakland Police Department leaving the Oakland United School District is such an amazing win. But I think you're so right that there's a lot of different reforms that need to happen over time. And I think that there's different places that we all play, um, or roles that we all play within this movement to make sure that that's happening. Um, I also want to acknowledge, I think it's something that we talked a little bit about on our um, kind of panelist prep call was that a lot of the information coming out right now is still centering uh, white people in many ways of the content that we're putting out there, the way that we're supporting on the way that we're informing um, others. And so I want to elevate this question from Georgian Ramos. Um, as Black women and women of color, any advice on how one can establish yourself as a leader in a white male dominated environment? As a Latina in New York City in the nonprofit world, I'm always looking for guidance from other women in the community on le and in leadership roles on how to plant your stake in the ground. I love that question. Ooh, that is a tough one. I'm still doing it. <laughs> Um, can you repeat the last part, Magna? Yes. Um, so the last part of the main question is, um, as Black women and women of color, any advice on how one can establish yourself as a leader in a white dominated environment, white male dominated environment? Leader in a white male dominated environment. Um, that one, you can't, mm. I would, I would probably first start with, I'm just a stream of consciousness, I'd probably first start with figuring out who are my current and most likely to be allies at that company. Um, I would start and, and start maybe possibly rallying them and having a conversation because you're gonna have to make sure you have some people on your side. Um, and, and you know best kind of who's the, the, who are the people to talk to at your company who might make the most sense. 
to get behind you on something like this. Uh, but it's gonna, it involves taking a risk. Um, as a black woman, I take a risk every day that I start something or try something. Uh, I take a risk every day I speak up in a meeting, you know? And in a room full of men, I'm often in a lot of those rooms where it's just me and men, me and non-black men. So I definitely can relate to that. Um, I think at my, at my other job, which I work at a company um, on the corporate side also, I have probably rallied up to like 15 or 20 people over the course of six to eight months and it's real work, you know? And then now it's like, all right, we have Juneteenth has a paid holiday. We have a 50K fund all of a sudden, you know? But that took honestly a course of six to eight months of also me getting more POC, by POC people hired as well. That was also a big deal in fighting within my company and fighting within my platform is also like starting with employment and encouraging my employers to hire more black people as well as see me more black resumes in. Um, I've used those things and then I've also, and, that, and at that point, once you get to like, you know, a year, like you built kind of your community, if that makes sense. You build the people who are gonna rally against you. Cause if it's you by yourself, it can seem a little bit daunting or intimidating, but if it's you plus five other people, you plus honestly three other people that can honestly help. So. I would focus on having some hard conversations, finding your allies first, finding your accomplices. You're gonna have your allies, which are usually, uh, a, that's a word that's usually used for uh, black indigenous POC. And then you have accomplices, which are considered more so um, white allies, but accomplice means you're putting your privilege on the line in order to participate in anti-racism. That was a mouthful, I can go into it a little further, but I would definitely work on conversations with potential allies, conversations with potential accomplices, um, and then take those conversations to your higher ups. I, I want to piggyback off that and just talk about my personal experience. Um, working in a lot of big institutions, I did all the right things to, um, you know, get allies and uh, not to take away from what Amanda's saying at all. Those are all amazing things. And they all make sense. So I did all of those things and I found that I was putting so much effort into that that it was almost making me sick. Um, it was, and I started to think, what would happen if I didn't put all my mental energy into trying to get one person on my side, another person, advocate, and then, and I realized every time I advocated for myself, I was always somehow in trouble. I never knew where the trouble was coming, but it was like either I I advocate for myself and in the most um, democratic, you know, professional way, and then out the corner of my eyes, like a white woman crying, and I know, oh boy, I'm about to go to HR, you know, for for nothing. But that's what it is, you know, it's weaponizing tears and things like that. And I got so tired of it, and then I started to think, what could be worse? than doing this uh and i had to also realize that where i was my ideas were only validated if a white man validated them for me and i got so tired of that and one day it just almost took me out of the game and i ended up uh leaving everything and then when it came time for me to try to apply another job um and you know do my whole career climb all over again i just didn't have it in me like i didn't want to do any more of it and that's how i actually started my own company um so i always tell people like there there are ways you can climb and stuff but also you may owe it to yourself to just think is this what i even want to be doing um and then when you have it from that angle you have a lot of other options and you don't have to do it by yourself do you have another friend that's frustrated with you what change do you really want to do and together you can go so much further um so there are all different ways to do it but i'll say i got so good at at gaming the system and getting all these allies it actually made me sick i mean yeah. i mean physically sick i mean eye twitching stress headache all these physical things that i couldn't figure out what was happening until i left it and then i had to think why was i doing it in the first place to Kai's point, sometimes the platform or company is no longer for you also. And sometimes the best thing you can do for them is to quit and tell them about themselves and write an open letter on Medium, write an open letter to CC your whole company on your last day. Like, you don't have to stick that shit out. Like, for some people, the best thing to do is center your mental health, like Kai said, and, and, and teach them by leaving. And by being honest, when you go out that door, every time you exit a door, every time you exit a racist door, a discriminatory door, you need to tell them, hey, these are the issues I had problems with. And everyone needs to be on that email. <laughs> so that's another, I'm glad Kai, you said that because mental health is really important. And I've had times where I can't get out of bed or I'm nauseated from seeing a, a black body retweeted on Twitter, you know, from a, a, a murder from a cop. Like, so there's certain things where, and, and then no one talks about it at work the next day. And that's your environment for two or three years. So. Um, so the people who are on the leadership side understand how mentally violent it is for such public things to happen, 
but no one to discuss at work. And that a lot of your black employees have probably felt alone and depressed when they've gone home after you've talked about everything to do with a TV show, but not the black life that was on CNN or Fox yesterday. So just keep that in mind. Like, you know, both sides have to, yeah. Yeah, I, the joke for all of my friends at work is they always call me the sacrificial lamb or the martyr because like as soon as I leave and set yeah. it off, everything gets better. Yeah, <laughs> hey, I'm off. tired. <laughs> so like Van just saying, sometimes leaving is really great because they have to hold you. Like by leaving, I am taking them to task. So a lot yeah. of comments in the in the chat are like, you know, rest is action, leaving is action. Some of these things are action; they're overlooked, and it takes so much strength to do that. So I have to stress that. Um, and, you know, and just really t t taking the time to check in with yourself when you're having these battles and really take the time to think, why, why are you, what are you fighting for? Yeah, so powerful. Olivia, do you have anything you want to add to that too? I mean, I was just thinking that like, you know, for the majority of my working life, um, I have not, I've just worked in community spaces that have been run largely by women of color and have not had a lot of experience working in a lot of like white dominated spaces or like white male spaces. And I just feel like I'm at a point now where I'm just like, I don't even care to do that. <laughs> um, and I don't want, like, I don't want to. And, um, you know, I think all of us here on this panel have really created a space for us to be able to thrive. And I think at the end of the day, it's like, for me, it's like, it's not about the paycheck right now. I mean, we all have to eat, but like just really being able to carve out and work with people that I care about and I feel passionate about and I trust and I want to work for and work with and we're like collaborating. Um, a lot of those times those aren't those, that's not the white dominated space for me. So I don't know if I have much insight, but I would just echo just like finding your community, finding your people that you can branch off and start new stuff with. Um, you know, I think the three of us have also participated in programs for free that have offered us like access to funders and like those kinds of things. So, you know, places like Founders Gym, um, Strive, those kinds of places where, you know, you can get those free access, free access to that work. I don't know it's free for everyone. It was free for us, but that was awesome. So. <laughs> For um, but <laughs> also a great program to recommend is Founder Gym. And I, I want to kind of highlight this. I think this is such a great answer. And I want to highlight some of the things that y'all said. Um, there's a lot um, to kind of putting yourself in different situations. And I really think that there's a place for everyone in the resistance. For some people, that is fighting those structures and being within um, structures that are predominantly white male and finding your space in that. I think all of us have had different experiences of going through that in some way, but ultimately also the three people on this call's panelists are founders, leaders as well. And I want to emphasize, I like see a lot of people saying like, oh, it's so rare to see like a panel of women of color, et cetera. Like this is not a diversity panel. This is just like, these are the experts in the field. Like these are the leaders and they are also women of color. And those things are not an accident, but I want to be clear that this isn't like a panel of diversity um, as is sometimes branded. These are just experts. And a lot of it is just that going through the experiences to get to a point of leadership is not easy. It takes a lot of resilience. It takes a lot of strategy. As Evangeline was saying, it's a lot of trial and error. Um, and as Kai was saying, it takes a lot of just, okay, I'm going to sell my car. I'm going to sell my house. I'm going to start my own thing because this is so important to me to live my truth that there's a lot of ways that especially as people of color you can feel trapped in feeling like you need to buy into a system in order to succeed but there's a lot of opportunity to also create your own so i, I encourage everyone to explore all different opportunities and also like notice who's leading and notice what leadership you actually want to be a part of um, and also to the point of it not being easy um, as has been mentioned a few times like self-care is so important um, and making sure that you're taking care of yourself because this is a marathon and being in resistance, like speaking out against your company, finding your allies, that's all a lot of work. Um, and it's, you can kind of pick what kind of emotional labor and work you want to be doing, but it's not easy, but it isn't lonely. There's a lot of really cool opportunities. And I think that there's a lot of really good examples on this panel of people who have ha found and are still working towards finding their way in all of this. Um, and I want to kind of move on to another question for y'all, which is in this moment, um, in this movement, 
what are some of the pitfalls you're seeing in the way that leaders and organizations are addressing this issue um, and addressing the uprising? And pitfalls might be too strong um, of a word in that we are still in the beginning of all of this, but I would love to hear um, what y'all have to say on that. Uh, I think number one that I've seen is posting solidarity messages, but not checking in directly with your black employees. That is a direct contradiction of each other. And if I see it one more time, I'm going to scream. <laughs> but like, seriously, like there's, here's what I want everyone to understand. At the core of racial justice, justice is understanding. And if you, if the person doesn't have the understanding, they have to have also the desire to understand. So a solidarity message does not equate to understanding, you know? it starts inside your company and also out. So in addition to giving to different charities and orgs and working with different um, black leaders and founders and making your org um, a champion of being and living anti-racist, you have to also, I think, understand that like each black person affects another black person. You know, we are kind of automatic representatives of our community, whether we like it sometimes or not. So when you talk to us, when, when you sit down with a black person and like break bread at that company, you talk to an employee in a real and honest way and hold that space for them, that goes a long way. It really does go a long way. So I just don't want people to underestimate like the value of like direct, uh, I, it's COVID, so <laughs> don't kill me, but <laughs> understanding the value of like a direct conversation and a direct plan that integrates and is co-planned also by black people is really important because we have to have a say in what's also happening if we're up to it at the moment. So I also want to respect people's time to grieve and be alone with their trauma. But overall, yeah, talk to your employees, have real conversations with them, um, navigate and bring someone in to help you figure out what's the best format and method for that. Uh, obviously, it can feel mentally violent to have Black employees in a room with white employees and you're non-black employees and you're talking about how white people can respect black life or you know be anti-racist so just it can seem very finicky and that's because it is we're talking about real human lives we're talking about black lives specifically so um just some encouragement to actually i really personally think that a lot of this movement it starts with talking to black people sitting down with them breaking bread and removing the surface level stuff removing the performative activism the performative solidarity and really talking to another human you know that's where it starts. It goes way further than that, but you can't post solidarity messages and then also not really invest in the mental health and wellness of Black employees. One thing that I just started calling out this week is I was sick of all the emails coming out about the things people are resolving to do. Uh, and I just started to respond back to them and, and finding the email addresses of everybody who's the head of the organizations and saying like, hey, how about you ask me what I need first? Um, like I had my, my college was like, oh, for black entrepreneurs, we're gonna give you a sticker. <laughs> and I was like, and it's a, a sticker to support black, you know, like, and I was like, I, I don't want your sticker. <laughs> and I was like, I want, I want funding. I want access to business resources. I, I gave him a huge list. And I was like, but you wouldn't know that if you asked me a question before you gave this email out. So I feel like everybody wants to have the right solution and be praised for it. Nobody is brave enough to start asking questions um, and admitting, I don't know the answers and I'm trying to find those answers. And that's what I want more humility um in a lot of this a lot of these conversations I, and i feel like my new job ended up being like white woman counselor and i don't mean anything bad with that but i'm on zoom calls we're having conversations and everybody is is um telling you know like i'm afraid to have these conversations because people get mad with me and i don't know what to say and i was like good people get mad at me every day and i never know what to say and it makes me grow um, so sit in that uncomfortableness. Um, but I hate to have to keep saying that to people, but if not, the conversations turn into, what do I do? Tell me what to do. And I, and that's also very, um, we don't have time for that either. So I always encourage people to listen, to ask questions, and it's okay to admit, I don't know, can you help me? Yeah, and hire, hire Black people to come help you, pay them. You know, knocking on everyone else's door for free, though, is not going to sit right with Black people who are currently trying to get their mental health together. And focus on themselves, like do pay the people and understand that the people who are doing the work are also like, um, Kai said earlier, they're also, um, they're in, they're, the trauma is probably real lived experience trauma. So be mindful of that, but those pay the people who are doing the work and have them come in and help you instead of asking like, you know, different black employees or people to keep you, pro keep you posted on protests. Like that's also mentally violent is telling black people to keep you posted on stuff. 
you know, when it comes to the organization, the movement, like you have to do the research and, and make sure that you have a system and routine in your life, you know, and that it also involves your company or your personal life that permits for you to be anti-racist. I would just add that the the slogan and phrase Black Lives Matter has become so trendy and it's become sort of this flag to be like, I'm safe, like don't mess with me because I'm putting this thing on my business or, you know, we put out this message. Um, and I just feel like, I don't know, that's just overwhelming and kind of disgusting in some ways too. Like I was just, you know, seeing businesses be like, we're donating, you know, this much money to Black Lives Matter. It's like, okay, to the headquarters or to where are you donating to, you know, like, um, so like um, Evangeline just said, just like hire Black people to, to tell you how to do it, tell you what organizations are local that you should be funding um, and redistribute that wealth. Like it's time, like just, fund these organizations that are doing great work to uplift the black community. So that's all I want to add. Amazing. Okay. So I'm going to kind of try to summarize or highlight these main things that I've heard. One, ask black people what they want and hire black people to come and do this work. Um, and then another really good point is just how much performance is happening, how many, how much people are putting things out there without ever asking anyone. We really need people to sit with discomfort and do the research. Do, don't just look to people to provide the answers for you. Um, and I think kind of in relationship to a lot of the things that y'all were talking about and about getting paid, um, so many people lovingly have put in the Q&A and in the chat, um, what is, like basically, how can um, the audience help and support you? Um, what is your company looking for and what are you as individual leaders looking for? Um, and this was asked, I'll shout out some names, but Sergio, um, Josh, Aaron, um, I think Rick asked this as well. Um, yeah, go ahead. Um, you can follow me at underscore Vange, V-A-N-G on Instagram. I put it in the chat. You can follow Women Sound Off, just at Women Sound Off. Um, com. we're always taking donations we're doing active supply drives in east oakland um i'm always looking for ways to partner on content also um as well as we women's time also consult on this on the side of making sure that women of color are more present across offices and in, included in the fabric of platforms so just reach out to me shoot us an email online info at women sound off uh, i'll drop my email also in the chat uh but yeah we're doing this 365 so those are our platforms and we're always down to talk and chat. Um, I'm in fundraising mode for my company. So we're always looking for, you know, at the end of this, companies cost a lot of money. Uh, so in addition to uh, fundraising uh, with, you know, venture capitals and things like that, we also love any donation we can get. So I just dropped our donation link to our uh, GoFundMe. Our goal right now is 500K. I think we're at about almost, we're about to hit 140,000. Uh, so any, any, a ten dollars is helpful. Anything at all adds up, uh, big or small. So thank you in advance. We really do appreciate everything we get. Yeah, I would say the same. Um, fund us. Fund all of our programs. Um, donate. Any little thing helps. Um, I would also say, aside from following the Glover Center and following the um, OCHER, which is our parent organization. Um, you know, always looking for like um, to connect with other groups doing similar work or just, you know, spread spreading the word about the work that we are doing um, and connecting us with, you know, other potential funders, other potential partners, um, things like that as well. Awesome. Okay. I just dropped summaries in the chat in case anyone ever reference back to that. <laughs> um, and as we kind of near um, closing out this panel, I would love to ask this beautiful closing question asked by Joshua Torres. Uh, what are some things that are making you really hopeful about this moment in time? I think for me, the willingness to understand has gone up. Um, at first I was super emotional when I felt more seen because I can't say I'm seen but I felt more seen than before and it was like wow like all these problems the last death was the same honestly as George Floyd the last the last time we protested and marched it was the same as this like the last 20 deaths were killed by cops were the, the same as this but now I've, I felt seen that made me emotional and kind of sad and then I moved into 
being more hopeful that people were willing to see our pain and our struggles and the things that we're actively going through and the down to the microaggressions. And when people are actually, dis not everyone, but a lot of people are actually discussing like the microaggressions that happen at companies and universities um, and just general interactions with white people who are in general in positions of power or just not. <laughs> like, so uh, I've been hopeful. The willingness to understand has been nice and it has been um, something that I have prayed and hoped for that people would be willing to put themselves in an uncomfortable position and be okay with being told they're wrong in order to really make something progress. So yeah, I'm hopeful in general. I'll stick to my same answer. Kids make me hopeful. Uh, so I never lose faith as long as I work with kids because I know they, they have everything they need. Um, and with encouragement, they're going to be just fine. And that will ensure all of us are just fine. Um, so I'm just waiting for them to come up and they've got next. Love that. Um, I'll just add that I think um, I am hopeful that we're in just like a, a new time and we're not going to go back to the old time. We can't go back to how it was at all. And um, we can only, you know, like, I don't know how it's going to look. It's going to be crazy. Like, I don't know, but it's, it's going to be different and it has to be. Um, and just seeing, you know, kind of all of these different failed systems come to light and be acknowledged and they all have to change. There's so many things that we are moving toward. Um, I, I feel hopeful too that like now these kinds of conversations around capitalism are also being tied in um, to, you know, kind of what's going on as well. Um, so yeah, I'm just, I'm, I, yeah. And then blanket statement, the kids as well, <laughs> being with the kids. <laughs> Um, thank you all so much for sharing that. Yeah, I am similarly so inspired by the youth, um, particularly in Oakland. I've just been seeing the youth leading a lot of the protests and the actions. Um, and it's so inspiring to see that there's a whole wave of people um, who don't want to normalize the way that society operates um, in the way that we've all gotten so used to normalizing it. Um, I think to your point, Evangeline, like I have also been really inspired by the conversations that we've been having. I actually see my dad on this call. <laughs> and so my dad and I have been having a lot of conversation. Um, my dad actually own, runs his own tech business um, in Atlanta. And we've been having a lot of conversation about what it means to be a leader of color, what it means to hire people of color and representation within his own company. And these are conversations that should have been happening a long time ago, but um, it's amazing to see the way that seams are really busting open and people are deciding to make decisions to not accept the status quo. Um, I think what you said earlier was really powerful as well, Kai, where you said rest is action and leaving is also action. Um, and hopefully as we all make more decisions to choose um, solidarity, choose the way that we can support and protect black lives and support all of the intersectional things that come with that, black trans women, black cis women, um, people with different abilities, et cetera. So it's really inspiring to see the way that many people are moving. And I also want to encourage everyone on this call and everyone's friends on this call, et cetera, um, to really take this moment as a choice and you can act and you can also not act. And all of those things are the same thing. They're still action. So making sure that you're tapping into your leadership is so important in this time. Um, and with that, I think I feel very ready to wrap up this call. Um, I wanna say a huge thank you to the three of you for not only being panelists in this moment, but every single way that you've shown me and taught me leadership in the many ways that you move within your organization. I feel like the whole world would be a lot better if y'all ran the Fortune 500, but then maybe the Fortune 500 wouldn't even exist. I don't really know what the future holds, but I'm super excited to see all of your future careers and the way that you continue to lead us in this movement. And with that, a huge thank you to everyone. Thank you for getting in the chat. Thank you for your questions and thank you for joining us. Um, hopefully we can continue to have more of these types of conversations. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for having us. Thank Bye. you so much.